Well, hello, Island of the Blue Dolphin Lovers. Lo I don't know. Do you love it yet? We're only in it three chapters. I mean, can you really love it quite yet? I don't know. You know, maybe it'll get to us, you know, this reading. We're going to read chapters four through six today. So let's see. Let's uh, kind of remember what's happened. Um, uh, they're on an island, the Channel Islands, and it's uh, um, Karana and her brother Ramo, and their dad is the chief. And then um, a boat with two red sails comes up, and it turns off at some guy named Captain Arloff, and he's got a bunch of alouettes with him. Uh, these are... Um, indigenous people from the Appala uh, from the uh, Aleutian Islands, way up by Alaska. And they've come down in this ship and they're hunting sea otters. And they want to hunt sea otters around the island where uh, Karana and her brother and her dad and her whole village is. But they don't want to stay on the ship because it's too stormy. They want to camp on the island. So they say, hey, we're going to camp here. We're going to hunt otters and we'll give you half. Well, they never really decided. I mean, first he said a third and the chief said, no, half. And so now they've been hunting otters and they've been watching them. Karana's people are kind of watching them a lot. I'm not sure they trust them. In fact, I think they're worried they're going to sneak off in the middle of the night and not pay, you know, not give them half the pelts, which was the whole idea. I don't know. There seems to be some mistrust. Do you think we can trust this um, Orloff guy to do the right thing? Let's find out. It's uh, chapters four through six, Scott O'Dell's classic Island of the Blue Dolphins. Here we go. The Aleuts left on a sunless day. Out of the north, deep waves rolled down upon the island. They broke against the rock and roared into the caves, sending up white sprays of water. Before night, a storm would certainly strike. Not long after dawn, the Aleuts took down their skin tents and carried them to the beach. Captain Orloff had not paid my father for the otters he had killed. So when news came that our hunters that the hunters had packed their tents, all of our tribe left the village and hurried toward Coral Cove. The men with their weapons went first and the women followed. The men took the trail that led to the beach, but the women hid themselves among the brush on the cliff. Ulap and I, that's her sister, remember? Ulap and I went together far out on the ledge where I had hidden before the hunters first came. The tide was low and the rocks of the narrow beach were scattered with bundles of otter pelt. Half of the hunters were on the ship. The rest were wading into the water, tossing the pelts onto a boat. The Aleuts laughed while they worked, as if they were happy to leave the island. My father was talking to Captain Orlov. I could not hear their words because of the noise the hunters made, but from the way my father shook his head, I knew he was not pleased. He is angry, Ulap whispered. Not yet. I said, when he is really angry, he pulls his ear. The men who were working on the canoe had stopped and were watching my father and Captain Orloff. The other men in our tribe stood at the foot of the trail. The boat went off to the ship, filled with otter. As it reached the ship, Captain Orloff raised his hand and gave a signal. When the boat came back, it held a black chest, which two of the hunters carried to the beach. Captain Orloff raised the lid and pulled out several necklaces. There was little light in the sky, yet the beads sparkled as he turned them this way and that. Beside me, Ulap drew in her breath in excitement, and I could hear cries of delight from the women hidden in the brush. But the cries suddenly ceased as my father shook his head and turned his back on the chest. The Aleuts stood silent. Our men left their places at the foot of the trail and moved forward a few steps and waited, watching my father. One string of beads for one otter pelt is not our bargain, my father said. One string and one iron spearhead, said Captain Orloff, lifting two fingers. The chest does not hold that much, my father answered. There are more chests on the ship, said the Russian. Then bring them to the shore, my father said. You have 105 bales of otter on the ship. There are 15 here in the cove. You will need three more chests of this size. Captain Orloff said something to his Aleuts that I could not understand, but its meaning was soon clear. There were many hunters in the cove, and as soon as he spoke, they began to carry the otter pelts up to the boat. Beside me, Ulap was scarcely breathing. Do you think he will give us the other chests? She whispered. I do not trust him. When he gets the pelts to the ship, he may leave. It is possible. 
the hunters had to pass my father to reach the boat, and when the first one approached him, he stepped in his path. The rest of the pelts must stay here, he said, facing Captain Orloff, until the chests are brought. The Russian drew himself up stiffly and pointed to the clouds that were blowing in toward the island. I load the ship before the storm arrives, he said. Give us the other chests, and then I will help you with our canoes, my father replied. Captain Orloff was silent. His gaze moved slowly around the cove. He looked at our men, standing on the ledge of rock a dozen paces away. He looked upward toward the cliff and back at my father, and then he spoke to his Aleuts. I do not know what happened first, whether it was my father who raised his hand against the hunter, whose path he barred, or whether it was this man who stepped forward with a bale of pelts on his back and shoved my father aside. It all happened so quickly, I could not tell one act from the other, but as I jumped to my feet and Ulap screamed and the other cries sounded along the cliff, I saw a figure lying on the rocks. It was my father and blood was on his face. Slowly he got to his feet. With their spears raised, our men rushed down across the ledge. A puff of white smoke came from the deck of the ship. A loud noise echoed against the cliff. Five of our warriors fell and lay quiet. Ulap screamed again and flung a rock into the cove. It fell harmlessly beside Captain Orloff. Rocks showered into the cove from many places along the cliff, striking several of the hunters, and then our warriors rushed in upon them. It was hard to tell one from another. Ulap and I stood on the cliff and watched helplessly, afraid to use the rocks, lest we injure our own men. The Aleuts had dropped the bales of otter. They drew knives from their belts, and as our warriors rushed upon them, the two lines surged back and forth along the beach. Men fell to the sand and rose to fight again. Others fell and did not get up. My father was one of those. For a long time, it seemed like we would win the battle, but Captain Orloff, who had rowed off to the ship when the battle started, returned with more of its Aleuts. Our warriors were forced backward to the cliffs. There were few of them left, yet they fought at the foot of the trail and would not retreat. The wind began to blow. Suddenly, Captain Orloff and his Aleuts turned and ran to the boat. Our men did not pursue them. The hunters reached the ship. The red sails went up, and the ship moved slowly between the two rocks that guard the cove. Once more before it disappeared, a white puff of smoke rose from the deck. As Ulap and I ran along the cliffs, a whirring sound like a great bird in flight passed above our heads. What do you think that white smoke from the ship was? And that whirring noise above there, I think it was a cannon. I think this Russian had a cannon. And you know, of course, uh, the tribe on, that lives on the island, they, they don't have cannons or anything like that. They just have spears. So I don't think they had a chance. The storm struck as we ran driving rain into our faces. Then other women were running beside us. Their cries were louder than the wind. At the bottom of the trail, we came upon our warriors. Many had fought on the beach. Few had left it, and of these, all were wounded. My father lay on the beach, and the waves were already washing over him. Looking at his body, I knew he should have told Captain Orloff his, he, he should not have told Captain Orloff his secret name. And back in our village, all the weeping women and the sad men agreed that this had weakened him so that he had not lived through the fight with the Aleuts and the dishonest Russian. End of chapter five. Well, there's our answer. No, they didn't pay him a dime. They got in a fight with him and they killed a bunch of them. They got in their boat with the two red sails and they left with all the otter pelts. Terrible day. Chapter five. That night was the most terrible time in all the memory of Galasat. That's their, their village, Galasat, their people. When the fateful day had dawned, the tribe numbered 42 men, counting those who were too old to fight. When night came, the women had carried back to the village those who had died on the beach of Coral Cove. There remained only 15. Of these, seven were old men. Wow, they lost a lot of men. There was no woman who had not lost a father or a husband or a brother or a son. The storm lasted two days, and the third day we buried our dead on the south headland. The Aleuts who had fallen on the beach, we burned. For many days after that, the village was quiet. 
People went out only to gather food and came back to eat in silence. Some wished to leave and go in their canoes to the island called Santa Catalina, Santa Catalina, which lies far off to the east. But others said that there was little water on that island. In the end, a council was held and it was decided to stay at Galasat. The council also chose a new chief to take my father's place. His name was Kim Ki. He was very old, but he had been a good man in his youth and a good hunter. The night he was chosen to be chief, he called everyone together, saying, Most of those who snared fowl and found fish in the deep water and built canoes are gone. The women, who were never asked to do more than stay at home, cook food, and make clothing, must now take the place of the men and face the dangers which abound beyond the village. There will be a grumbling at Galasat because of this. There will be shirkers, that means people that don't want to do the work. These will be punished, for without the help of all, all must perish. It means die. So it, things are going to change. We've all got to chip in. Kim Ki portioned work for each one in the tribe, giving Ulap and me the task of gathering abalones. This shellfish grew on rocks along the shore and was plentiful. We gathered them at low tide in baskets and carried them to the mesa, where we cut the dark red flesh from the shell and placed it on flat rocks to dry in the sun. Ramo had the task of keeping the abalones safe from the gulls and especially the wild dogs. Dozens of our animals, which had left the village when their owners had died, joined the wild pack that roamed the island. They soon grew fierce as the wild ones and only came back to the village to steal food. Each day toward evening, Ulap and I helped Ramo put abalones in baskets and carry them to the village for safekeeping. During this time, other women were gathering the scarlet apples that grow on the cactus bushes and are called tunas. Fish were caught and many birds were netted. So hard did the women work that we really far better than before when the hunting was done by the men. Life in the village should have been peaceful, but it was not. The men said that the women had taken the tasks that rightfully were theirs, and now that they had become hunters, the men looked down upon them. There was much trouble over this until Kim Ki decreed that the work would again be divided. Henceforth, the men would hunt and the women harvest. Since there was already ample food to last through the winter, it no longer mattered who hunted. But this was not the real reason why autumn and winter were unpeaceful at Galasat. Those who had died at Coral Cove were still with us. Everywhere we went on the island or on the sea, whether we were fishing or eating or sitting by the fires at night, they were with us. We all remembered someone, and I remembered my father, so tall and strong and kind. A few years ago, my mother had died, and since Ulap and I had tried to do the tasks she had done, Ulap even more than I, being older, now that my father was gone, it was not easy for us to look after Ramo, who was always into some kind of mischief. It was the same in the other houses of Galasat, but more than the burdens which had fallen upon us all, it was the memory of those who had gone that burdened our hearts. They're so sad. They, they miss all those people that were killed. After food had been stored in autumn and the baskets were full in every house, there was more time to think about them. So that sort of sickness came over the village and people sat and did not speak, nor even laughed. In the spring, Kim Ki called the tribe together. He had been thinking, he said, during the winter, and he had decided that he would take a canoe and go to the east to a country which was there and he had once been to when he was a boy. It lay many days across the sea, but he would go there and he would make a place for us. He would go alone because he could not spare more of the men for the voyage and he would return. The day Kim Ki left was fair. We all went to the cove and watched him launch the big canoe. It held two baskets of water and enough tuna and dried abalone to last many days. We watched Kim Ki paddle through the narrow opening of the rocks. Slowly he went through the kelp beds and into the sea. There he waved to us and we waved back. The rising sun made a silver trail across the water. 
along this trail, he disappeared to the east. The rest of the day, we talked about the journey. Would Kimki ever reach this far country about which nothing was known? Or would he come back before the winter was over? Or maybe never? That night, we sat around the fire and talked while the wind blew and the waves crashed against the shore. End of chapter five. Wow, things are so different on the island now. I mean, they're getting by, but I guess their new chief, Kimki, thinks, we can't stay here. We're going to have to leave. So he's going to go to this land that he went to when he was a boy. It's far to the east. I wonder where he's going. I wonder what he'll find there. And will he ever come back? Let's find out in chapter six. Here we go. Chapter six. After Kimki had been gone one moon, one moon is like a full moon to a full moon. So it's about 30 days. We would call it a month. After Kimki had been gone one moon, we decided to watch for his return. Every day, someone went to the cliff to scan the sea. Even on stormy days, we went, and on days when fog shrouded the island. During the day, there was always a watcher on the cliff, and each night as we sat around our fires, we wondered if the next sun would bring him home. But the spring came and left, and the sea was empty. Kimki did not return. There were a few storms that winter, and rain was light and ended early. This meant that we would need to be careful of water. In the old days, the spring sometimes ran low, and no one worried, but now everything seemed to cause alarm. Many were afraid that we would die of thirst. There are other things more important to ponder, said Matasiap, who had taken Kimki's place. Matasiap meant the Aleuts for it was now the time of year when they had come before. Watch it, see they're worried these Aleuts are gonna come back. Golly, and hunt again, that'd be terrible. Would they kill them? Would they just steal the otters? Watching on the cliff, uh, began to look for the red sails, and a meeting was held to plan what to do if the Aleuts came. We lacked the men to keep them from landing or to save our lives if they attacked us, which we were certain they would. Plans were therefore made to flee as soon as their ship was sighted. Flee means to run away. Food and water were stored in canoes, and these were hidden on the rocks at the south end of the island. The cliffs were steep here and very high, but we wove a stout rope of bull kelp and fastened it to the rocks at the top of the cliff, so it hung into the water. As soon as the Aleut ship was sighted, <clears throat> we would all go down to the cliff and let ourselves down one at a time. We would then leave in our canoes for the island of Santa Catalina. Although the entrance to Coral Cove was too narrow for a ship to pass through safely at night, men were sent there to watch the cove from dusk to dawn, besides those who watched during the day. Shortly afterwards, on a night of a fine moon, one of the men came running back to the village. Everyone was asleep, but his cries quickly awakened us. The Aleuts, he shouted, the Aleuts! It was news we expected. We were prepared for it, yet there was much fear in the village of Galasat. Matasiap strode from hut to hut, telling everyone to be calm and not to lose time packing things that would not be needed. I took my skirt of yucca fiber, however, for I had spent many days making it, and it was very pretty, and also my otter cape. Quietly, we filed out of the village along the trail that led toward the place where our canoes were hidden. The moon was growing pale and there was a faint light in the east, but a strong wind began to blow. We had gone no farther than half a league when we were overtaken by the man who had given the warning. He spoke to Matasiap and we all gathered round to listen to him. I went back to the cove after I gave the alarm, he said, and when I got there, I could see the ship clearly. It is beyond the rocks that guard the harbor. It is a smaller ship than the one that belonged to the Aleuts. The sails are white instead of red. Could you see anyone? Matasiap asked. No. Is it not the same ship that was here last spring? No. Matasiap was silent, pondering the news. Then he told us to go out to where the canoes were and wait for him, for he was going to go back. It was light now, and we went quickly over the dunes to the edge of the cliff and stood there while the sun rose. The wind grew cold, but fearing that those on the ship would see the smoke, we did not start a fire, although we had meal to cook for breakfast. Instead, we ate a small quantity of dried abalone, and afterwards, my brother Ramo climbed over the cliff. 
No one had been down to the rocks since the canoes were hidden, so we did not know whether they were still safe or not. While he was gone, we saw a man running across the dunes. It was Nanko, carrying a message from Matasya. He was sweating in spite of the cold, and he stood trying to catch his breath. We all waited, urging him to talk, but his face was happy, and we knew that he brought good news. Speak, everyone said in a chorus. I have been running for more than a league, he said. I cannot talk. <coughs> you are talking, someone said. Speak, Nano, speak, cried many voices. Nanko was having fun with us. He threw out his chest and took a deep breath. He looked around at the circle of faces, as if it did, he did not understand why everyone was staring at him. The ship, he said at last, saying the word slowly, does not belong to our enemies, the Aleuts. There are white men on this ship, and they have come from the place where Kimki went when he left our island. Has Kimki returned? An old man broke in. No, but it is he who saw the white men and told them to come here. What do they look like? Ulap asked. Are there boys on the ship? Asked Ramo, who had come back with his mouth full of something. Everyone seemed to be talking at once. Nanko made his face stern, which was hard for him to do because his mouth had been cut in the battle with the Aleuts, and ever since it had always seemed to smile. He held up his hand for silence. The ship has come for one reason, he said, to take us away from Galasat. To what place, I asked. It was good news that the ship did not belong to the Aleuts. But where would the white men take us? I do not know to what place, he said. Kimki knows and he has asked the white men to take us there. Saying no more, Nanko turned back, and we followed him. We were fearful of where we were going to go, yet we were happy too. Wow. So another boat has come. It's full of white men, and they claim that Kimki told them to come to that island and take all the people back to where he was. So Kimki made it to this land, I guess, where he was a boy, talked to some men, some white men, they got a boat. They went back out to the island to get everybody. So should they get on the boat and leave the island? I wonder what's going to happen. I guess we'll find it's so hard to say goodbye, isn't it? You know, it's hard to say goodbye to a place. It's hard to say goodbye to people. I think you're going to write about that in your packet today. Have you ever had a hard time? Let's see, what is it? It says right about the time you had to say goodbye to someone that you cared about. How did it make you feel? How does it feel to say goodbye? It's sad, usually, especially somebody you care about. You know, am I ever going to see him again? How often am I going to see him? You remember all the fun you had? You're not going to have that? Maybe it's easy for us nowadays because we can keep in touch with the phone and text and Zoom and all this other stuff we've got. But back in these old-fashioned days, you know, when you said goodbye to somebody, you might never see him again. I don't know. So that's your right. So don't forget to do your packet and work through all that. And I'll see you next time for chapters 7, 8, and 9. The book's getting pretty good, huh? All right, see you then. Adios, my friends.